Hello everyone. Our speaker for today is Craig Marshall, who is the Town of Clinton historian and vice president of the Clinton Historical Society. He gives presentations on local history, develops and presents historical exhibits, and is currently working with the Dutchess County Historical Society on the Veterans Oral, Oral History Project. Craig is chair of the Dutchess County Historical Society Vice President's Group, which is a collaboration of 17 historical societies and municipal historians of Dutchess County. Craig, I'll now make you the presenter. Hello to all. Uh, thank you. Hello to all. Thank you for attending today's session, The History of the Town of Clinton. My name is John Frederick Schultz. I was born in 1772 and died in 1823, spending most of my life in Clinton. I know you were expecting Craig Marshall, the Clinton town historian today, but after much thought, he decided that with my background, it would be a better idea if I gave the presentation and I'm pleased to do so. You see, the history of Clinton closely follows the story of the town's seven major hamlets. And since I founded one of those hamlets in 1807, I can relate to you firsthand how our town grew over the years. So let's begin. The story of Clinton really begins with a story of Dutchess County in 1674, the English ousted the Dutch in New York City and then controlled all the land. 24 years later, a group of nine New York City businessmen negotiated the purchase of 145,000 acres in the county from the Wappenders Native Americans and obtained ownership officially through a land grant by the New York governor in 1697. The area was called the Great Nine Partners Patent and included the area that was to become Clinton. Patents later developed into precincts and in 1786, Clinton Precinct was established and included what is today Clinton, Pleasant Valley and Hyde Park. It was called the town of Clinton two years later and 1788 is recognized as the beginning of our town. Several years passed until 1821, when Hyde Park and Pleasant Valley were established as separate towns, and the Clinton boundaries became what we know as Clinton today. Our town was named after George Clinton, the first governor and longest serving governor of New York State. He then served eight years as vice president under Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Surveying proceeded to establish land boundaries called Great Lots, which divide the land among the nine partners. Early access to the Clinton area was by means of a wagon path road established in 1713, shown here in red, that stretched from Dover in the Beekman Patent to the south to Rhinebeck in the north, where Henry Beekman collected his wheat rent from his Dover tenants. Additional spur roads were added in 1748, with all roads passing through what is now the hamlet of Schultzville. With this access beginning around 1740, farmers came to the town from overcrowded New England, finding fertile soil for their crops. Previously in 1709, there was a large migration of German Palatines to the US, to the US seeking religious freedom and many settled in Germantown, some then moving to Rhinebeck and then to Northwest Clinton. English settlers, including a significant number of Quakers, settled in the eastern portion around Clinton Corners. Additional interior roads were built, bringing more settlement through the land, either purchased or leased. In the 1800s, farming was so developed that 80% of the land which was all the tillable land was cleared or being cultivated. The remaining 20% became woodlots. So just imagine Clinton without trees. The principal farm product was wheat, which in the early days was harvested by hand with horse-drawn wagons, with older sons and hired help assisting the farmer. 
wives were also engaged in farm labor, doing more than cooking and washing. It was a family affair. And here, a young boy is raking grain. It wasn't until the 1920s or later that gas-powered tractors were affordable and used to increase production. Besides grain, fruit orchards provided an important crop. Then, as now, spraying was required, as shown here as a three-man operation, with one man operating the manual piston pump on the wagon. Census takers in the 1860s were tasked with officially recording farming operations, but Clinton farmers, like others, did not attach much importance to the numbers. One frustrated pollster in 1865 complained, not one farmer in 10 keeps any account of their business transactions. They forget or cannot remember the number of acres they pasture or plow. They don't know the number of acres in their fields or the amount of bushels of grain or the amount of money received. The grain harvesting drove the demand for grist mills for processing, which no farmer could do by themselves. In this map of Clinton, notice the abundance of streams in blue. These many streams attracted not only farmers, but enterprising men who built the grist mills, sawmills, and cider mills to service the growing agricultural business. Hamlets typically started with a mill, followed by a store, then a blacksmith shop, then homes and shops that often housed tradesmen, such as shoemakers, harness makers, and tanners. This was the case with all seven major hamlets shown here. They all started with grist mills and became principal centers of services to the town. Let's visit these hamlets, beginning in Schultzville, because this is where my story begins. You see, in 1797, I was co-owner co of a grist mill in Rhinebeck, but I had always wanted my own mill. At that time, I was also captain of the sloop farmer on the Hudson River, carrying product animals and passengers between Rhinebeck and New York City. By 1807, I had saved enough to purchase 220 acres in what is now Schultzville, where it had the strong flowing Wappingers Creek. I dammed the creek and built the grist mill shown here. My water wheel drove not just one set of grindstones, but four sets. In later years, about 1850, this mill run by my son Daniel was earning $10,000 per year, a great sum in those days. By the way, our grist mill also ground plaster, which was used in the building trade. When I built the grist mill, I also built this large general store. I sold tool, food, tools, tobacco, dry goods, and much more. Sometimes for payment, I took eggs in trade. Both Daniel and I kept daily accounts called day books of our store and mill transactions. Here is one of our 10 day books that survive today and are being preserved by Mr. Marshall. My day books to 1823 recorded cash in pounds, shillings, and pence. Store burned in 1930, but was rebuilt on the original 1807 foundation and is standing today, shown here in 1954. Along with the mill and the store, I also built my house, shown here around 1940. By the way, I've added green stars in the upper right-hand corner for this and several other images of building that you'll be viewing today because they still survive. And that adds to the historic character of our Clinton. A few years after my passing in 1823, two more significant services were established. My son, Daniel, built a large sawmill Next to the grist mill, which operated for many years, it was abandoned in the late 1800s, as shown here. And this blacksmith shop ran for many years, becoming an auto repair shop called the Schultzville Garage, near the end of its commercial life. On the other side of the shop, shown more fully in this image, you can see a ramp that reached to the ground where wagons were pulled up through the double doors on the second floor for repair. 
over 100 years later, this ram still exists. So now with a grist mill, a sawmill, a blacksmith shop, general store, and a few small homes and shops, the hamlet of Schultzville came to be. And this was the general model for growth of the other six major, major hamlets in town, but were all varied in size and services. These services attracted newcomers and the town of Clinton grew in population. Schultzville also continued to grow. And in 1850, this schoolhouse was built when the town was divided into 11 school districts, each with its own one-room schoolhouse. This photo possibly of a graduation event is interesting to me in seeing the fancy hats on the ladies with this closer look. My favorite is the second one, one the second from the left. It almost appears that the hat is about to sprout wings and take off. As evidenced by this photo, all one room schools in the district had grades one through eight taught by a single teacher, some of whom lived with their student families. Speaking with some of today's residents who attended these schools reveals their strong conviction that they were well prepared for high school that followed. While one grade was seated in the front row being taught, the younger grades were being helped by the older grade students. And many students learned beyond their grade early by listening in on the older grades being taught. Note the single privy in the, the background with the arrow how challenging it was to use in the winter, tramping through two feet of snow or more and into frigid air. All schoolhouses in Clinton were closed around the 1950s and 1960s when school consolidation occurred, sending all Clinton residents to central schools in Millbrook, Hyde Park, Pine Plains, and Rhinebeck. This next story makes me both sad and very proud. By 1860, Schultzville had no church. My grandson, Theodore Augustus Schultz, everybody called him Gus, contracted tuberculosis in his early 20s. In his final months, he sought out local clergy and obtained their agreement that if he were to pay to build a church, they would support it with a minister. Gus died at age 23 in 1862, and in his bequest, he left $3,000 and land to build this church, which was completed in 1865. The church has a very active congregation today. One year later, this parsonage was built alongside the church. The photo taken around 1915 shows the parson's wife and the parson sporting a very snappy derby. Churches often played an important role in social life beyond religion. Events like this 1905 clam bake brought families together as relief from the rigors of farming. One of the youth organizations to meet at the church was this lovely group of campfire girls around 1915. Coming back to Gus, there is more to his story. As he was an active Mason of Warren Lodge number 32, which was meeting in Lafayetteville, Gus also left in his bequest $2,000 and land to build this Masonic Hall in the Hamlet, also built in 1865. The Masons met here continuously through 1999, when severely decreased membership prompted them to donate the structure to the Clinton Historical Society, which restored the building and used it for community events. Then in 2011, Ownership was transferred to the town, which needed to expand office space. The building was moved one quarter mile down the road to the Clinton Historical Center, which already had the 1924 town hall, a 1976 library wing, and a re reconstructed 1850 Spooky Hollow schoolhouse. It is shown leaving its original site in the hamlet. Here it is arriving at the new site and the schoolhouse can be seen in the, in the background. The first floor was repurposed for offices and the original second floor Masonic temple room remains intact for ongoing meetings by the Warren Mason 
but also for community use. Regarding my grandson, Gus, I know he will always be remembered for his thoughtful and generous gifts to the Clinton community. Before we leave Schultzville, I would like to note one young enterprising fella, Ezra Wager. Around 1925, he owned and operated this steam powered sawmill, which like large sawmills, supported an important building trade. He is buried in the Schultzville Hamlet and was the grandfather of Richard Wager, the former publisher of the Poughkeepsie Journal. And speaking of engines, this creative entrepreneur mounted an engine on his wagon and would go from farm to farm cutting firewood for heating and cooking by connecting his engine pulley belt to the buzz saw of the farmer. And you can see the pile of cut firewood in the background. As the hamlet of Schultz was forming and growing, so were the six other major hamlets in town. Let's visit them, starting with Frost Mills. In Frost Mills, this grist mill was one of the earliest and longest serving mills and was built around 1761 by Peter DeWitt. He provided services for the American military during the Revolutionary War. This mill was unusual because instead of a water wheel, the millstones were driven by a water turbine. You can see the horizontal chute feeding water to the turbine on the right in this photo with the arrows pointing. The water entering the turbine at the top causes the turbine blades, much like an auger, to turn, engaging the millstones. Mr. DeWitt also built his home in 1773, which has been restored and is on the National Historic Register. About the same year, he built this Dutch barn. Original barns of German, Dutch, and English styles are still found throughout the town and were important in agricultural operations since early times. As such, sawmills like this one and frost mills provided lumber to build these barns and houses. And this general store was built around 1850 across from the DeWitt Mills and also served as a doctor's office, which was accessed by the outside stairs to the second floor as shown. Stairs are still present there today. Pleasant Plains. In, Pleasant, in the Pleasant Plains Hamlet, located just one mile from Frost Mills, the principal structure is this Presbyterian church built in 1837. With the influx of German settlers in the area, families no longer had to travel to the distant Dutch Reformed Church in Württemberg. Undergoing enlargement 22 years later, it has been in continuous use to the present time. Across from the church, this blacksmith shop, shown in the 1867 town map, operated for many years. You can see several wagon wheels used for wagon repair. Clinton Hollow. This hamlet had not one, but three general stores. The principal one here had a large upper room that held town meetings, dances, and other social events. One enterprising, Salesman rented the room in 1902 to demonstrate the latest Edison talking machine to an enwrapped farm audience, some hearing for the first time opera singers, military bands, and more. The Reverend Amanda Deo, a Clinton resident and internationally famous as a peace activist and suffragist with Susan B. Anthony, held a revival in this hall in 1910. In later years, from 1934 to 1955, the Hamlet was a center for summer stock theater, drawing people from well beyond Clinton. The Reginald Good Theater had as its most famous actor, the 16-year-old Gene Wilder of Charlie and Chocolate Factory fame. Hibernia. This general store in the Hamlet of Hibernia also served as a post office, as many general stores did. A successful mill was nearby. Bull's Head. This general store and post office in Bull's Head was built around 1850 and shows some early transportation found in town. Besides the horse tied to the post, we see a motorized buckboard and a snappy gasoline runabout on the right. As the joke went, 
It was called a runabout because it would run about a mile and then stop. Stores were not the only means for families to purchase what they needed. Traveling peddlers like this one were common and saved trips for those farmers and wives who live far from the hamlets. This brings us to the last and largest hamlet of Clinton Corners. One of the oldest structures in Clinton is this Creek Meeting House built by the Quakers in 1777 and completed five years later. Both the stone building with 24 inch thick walls and the adjacent cemetery are on the National Historic Register. In 1828, there was a division based on differences in preaching whereby one group, the followers of Elias Hicks, called Hicksites, remained in this building and another group, the Orthodox, left and built this meeting house one mile away. In succeeding years, the Orthodox congregation outgrew this building and built this church across the street from the Hicksites in 1890. They continued to grow and in 1916, moved this building back 24 feet and built this structure attached to the front. Beautiful stained glass windows were evidence that though they were still called friends, the strict Quaker traditions had softened by this time. In 1906, the congregation purchased this mansard roof residence built in 1874 to use as a parsonage just down the road. As in Schultzville, the Hamlet Church was a center for much of the social and community interaction. There was a large men's club and the ladies auxiliary shown here held public dinners and other events that farming families looked forward to. Here is the church girls gym class. The gym was in the 1890 building, posing for a yearbook photo in 1932. You see nice serious expressions as was the custom of the day. However, immediately following that shot, something really funny happened and the photographer caught this shot which could be titled, Girls Just Having Fun. The church also had a drama group, which staged, pa staged pageants and theater shows like this. The Hamlet also had a Catholic mission church built in 1888, which was active until four years ago. When, when it and the Catholic mission church in Bangor were consolidated with the mother's church St. Joseph in Millbrook. This is the Clinton Corner Schoolhouse, located about 75 feet from the Salt Point Turnpike Road in front. During recess ball games, home plate was at the school steps, and any ball hit that reached the road was considered an automatic home run. As a member of the Clinton Historical Society in the 1990s, Robert Hancock, student far left, second row, shared many stories about the school and his other early Clinton experiences. The schoolhouse is now the only post office in Clinton, which once had 11 post offices before rural free delivery began in 1902. Clinton Corners became the largest hamlet with the arrival of the Poughkeepsie and Eastern Railroad, dubbed the p e in 1871, the only Clinton hamlet that had a railroad. Now, milk products could be shipped to Poughkeepsie, which spurred the building of this major business, major hamlet business, the Beaks Creamery. This caused many farms to switch from wheat and other grains to more profitable dairy farming. As the main agricultural business in Clinton, and this would last for many years. Prior to the automobile and truck, dairy farmers, as shown here, would load 10 gallon milk cans weighing 86 pounds onto the wagon every day and bring them to the creamery. The processed milk would then be loaded onto the rail car like the one shown on the left. The P&E would also pick up ice from Upton Lake adjacent to Clinton Corners from two large ice houses. This provided welcome income in the winter months for farmers who were employed to use their horses to pull the ice scoring rigs and to help cut the ice into cakes using large hand saws. The cakes were then guided through channels cut in the frozen lake 
to an inclined chain drive conveyor, which carried them into the ice house to be packed in sawdust. When the ice reached Poughkeepsie, firms like the Poughkeepsie Ice Company, shown here, would then deliver the ice to the homes and businesses in the city. As a major hamlet in Clinton after 1850, Clinton Corners also had the only telegraph in town. The sign on the American Rapid Telegraph Office says that to reach Chicago, the price was 50 cents for 20 words. The railroad also brought a new industry to Clinton, summer boarding houses, which provided a valued supplementary income to many farm families. In 1895, the PE Railroad brochure advertised this photo with the words, enjoy the clean, healthy country air and quiet bucolic surroundings. This ad was a relief to the New York City dirty from the New York City industrial air and the noise that was sometimes overwhelming back then. People did come in droves. When they arrived at the rail station, they were met by a wagon for one or two or a stage like this for more. They were taken either to the farm homes which catered to this trade or to dwellings like Idlewing Cottage in Clinton Corners, set up solely for this purpose by the Wing family. Posts advertised fresh milk, eggs, fruit, and clear spring water. Room and board cost $5 a week. Also in a hamlet, Carroll House provided many rooms solely for boarders. This building, built in 1794 with brick formed from clay found on the property, is a fine residence restored today. Another business in the hamlet began in 1907 when Smith Wing, living across from the Creek Meeting House, converted his barn into a dance hall. Growing in popularity year after year, he expanded his barn several times until it was 60 feet long. Young and old, including groups of Vassar College girls, danced to a live band that played foxtrots, waltzes, and especially square dances. There were strict rules. No alcohol or smoking, proper dress, men in collar, tie, and coat, and always gentlemanly conduct. Some dances were prohibited, including the tango, the turkey trot, and the bunny hug. Wings Hall ran for 43 years up until 1950. Across from Wings Hall, a major group, the Upton Lake Grange, rented and then in 1919, purchased a Creek Meeting House after the Hicksite Quakers died out a few years earlier. Granges were an important group in agricultural committees, communities everywhere. And this group continues today, but not at this site. In 1994, due to declining membership, the Grange donated the historic building to the Clinton Historical Society, which maintains it today for their educational exhibits and programs, their large archive, and for social activities. But in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, the Grange was a popular site for community dinners. Just look at what 50 cents could buy. They also had square dances and educational activities. Shown here are the newly installed Grange officers around 1930. All appear to be younger adults. Significantly, the Grange was the host for the major annual community day event held in the hamlet. This long-standing event drew hundreds of residents from all over Clinton and well beyond. As this 1938 poster advertises, there were shows of horses, flowers, and food, plus athletics and much more. A highlight was always a parade that drew floats built by school classes, political organizations, and other community groups in town. This 1932 photograph is of an elaborate pirate ship that was entered by the Clinton Corners school class. And this patriotic float came from the Schultzville school class. The local Boy Scout troop came with this float The Clinton Volunteer Fire Department was formed in 1931 in Clinton Corners and bought this used Model T fire truck, which is stored in a local garage. 
when more motorized equipment was purchased, a true firehouse was needed. After the PE Railroad disbanded, the group purchased the unused rail station in 1939 and converted to the first firehouse. Interestingly, when more room was needed in 1957, the new block firehouse was built around the old station, including the roof, and then the old station was dismantled and removed. In this way, their fire equipment was always under cover during construction. So we end our tour of the major hamlets that played a key role in the history of Clinton. But it would not be, Clinton history would not be complete without sharing some of the stories and tales that were passed through generations, such as the tale of Sodom Four Corners, which is a crossroad in town. The name reflects the period when it wasn't so attractive. By implication, its neighbors felt that it should have been destroyed for its wickedness, just as the biblical Sodom and Gomorrah were. According to town tradition, Sodom Four Corners was also known as Hell's Kitchen in the pre-Civil War days. These names were bestowed, so the story goes, because whiskey was sold on three of the Four Corners. Rough neighborhood. Another Clinton tradition is how Fiddler's Bridge Road got its name. The road connecting Pleasant Plains and Shulsville Hamlets commemorates a tale that began in 1808 it was September 7th when a, an old local resident who used to play his fiddle at dances and festivals was found dead on a bridge on this narrow winding road. Allegedly, he had been robbed and murdered on his way home after playing for a dance, and the bridge was later named Fiddler's Bridge. According to tradition, the fiddler's ghost can be heard playing the fiddle on certain moonlit evenings between 10 and midnight at the site, which no longer contains a bridge. But on to happier things. Clinton is very fortunate to have many historic homes, churches, and barns that still exist from early days with varied architecture. Its rural character is highly valued by present day residents in several groups, such as the Scenic Roads Committee, the Conservation Advisory Council, the Town Board, the Planning Board, and the ZBA all work to maintain this character. The Clinton Historical Society plays an active role with formal designation of historic sites as part of its landmarks program, where selected sites receive a plaque like this. In 2015, the Society published Building Clinton, an Archite architectural survey, 1760 to 1956, 1965 where 346 historic structures built in the 1700s and 1800s were noted. Included in the survey is this, the oldest house in Clinton built by John Crapser around 1760 and is made of stone. Another stone house was built by David Traver in 1764 and is also kept beautifully restored. The 1777 Creek Meeting House is in active use. And this Greek revival home was built by George Budd around 1846, showing alterations with a door and front porch removed. An example of Greek revival style, style appears with a William Leroy, Leroy home built around 1850 with a beautiful slate roof. And this home on the National Historic Register showcases the craftsman style as built in 1914. Designated a Clinton landmark, my son Daniel built this large home in 1856 in Schultzville. Sadly, he died two years later. It is of German Italian design and is now the home of Mr. Marshall and his wife, Mary. Well, we come to the end of our journey through the history of Clinton. It's been fun for me to relive the events and people and places in the town that I hold so dear. Before I go back to peace, to rest in peace, I would like to close by thanking all of you for joining me today. And I thank Mr. Marshall for this wonderful opportunity. He does have some closing words, so uh, please stand by. And again, thank you and goodbye.
Hi, this is Craig Marshall. Uh, thank you so much, John. You certainly did not disappoint, and uh, I learned a lot. I want to end with a thank you to the Clinton Community, excuse me, Clinton Community Library for this opportunity to tell our, our story. And I thank the Clinton Historical Society for use of the vintage images and information from their extensive archive. I am vice president of that organization, and we will be putting this presentation on our website in the next few months as well. Our website address appears here. We are always looking for vintage Clinton photographs, postcards, and artifacts to copy or photograph for our extensive archive. If you have any, or know of others who do, please contact us via email at info at clintonhistoricalsociety.org. And if you have any questions for me, my email address is craigmarshall266 at aol.com. Again, thank you all for joining us today and stay well.